with a Bible verse. Beat that big bad devil with a Bible verse. Yeah. Now before I have them come up and read verses, um, I, we've started doing sword drills downstairs, and I was amazed at how they love sword drills. Um, those of you that aren't familiar with what a sword drill is, where you hold a Bible in the air, I give them a reference, and they have to find it. Um, we've been studying books of the Bible and trying to learn them in order. And when I first started introducing them, I talked about how a knight wouldn't go into battle without his armor and without his sword. But many times Christians go into battle without our sword, our weapon, which is the Bible. We can say that we can beat the devil with a Bible verse. We can say that we can beat the devil with prayer. But unless we're actually doing it, our words mean nothing. So before they come up, I'm going to read Ephesians 6, 10 through 18 which says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's, God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Today... The day and age we live in is the most crucial time to be putting on our armor of God. As we know, everywhere we go, Christians are being persecuted, having people come against us, and the Bible talks about that. So it is very important for us today, more than ever, to put on our full body, of our full, full armor of God to withstand anything the devil has come our way. So I'm going to have Brianna and Zachary come up and read two verses for you this morning, too, that talk about strength and courage. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Proverbs 3, 5, 6. That's a very good. He gives the power to weaken strength to the powerless. Isaiah 40 through 29. Right. <laughs> the glory of the Lord.
something uh, very special on this family and friends day. Maybe you just stumbled in here today because somebody just invited you. And, uh, but I want to share with you this morning what I call just the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll talk to you about our Lord, what He means to us and how we can have life and have it more abundant. If you just stand with me please, I want to read this morning from Revelation that's the last book of the Bible, if you have it. Revelation chapter 1. And I want to start reading at verse 9. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. John begins in verse 9 saying, I, John, who, who wrote the book of Revelation, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now what's happened is John has gone through, he's identified with the Lord. They had tried to kill John because of his testimony, because of his, uh, his love for the Lord. Uh, one writer even told us, a writer named Josephus even told us, that they dipped John in hot burning oil. Like you would dip an ice cream cone in chocolate and pull it back out. But that would be alright. But this was terrible. They dipped him in hot burning oil. And this John was so tough. That it didn't even get... Josephus said that the, the skin just peeled off his body. Like he would peel back an onion. They tried to kill him. John was so tough he didn't die. And so they said, let's just put him on the Isle of Patmos, a Greek island, away from family for him to live isolated and be alone for the rest of his life. But listen to what happened. He's right there. That's where this is. When he writes these words, and he says, it comes Sunday, the Lord's Day, and he said, I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, 
I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were like wool, were white like wool, and white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. What a picture that is. And when I saw him, this is the vision he's having. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades or hell and death. Now, Lord, we love you this morning. Thank you for this beautiful picture in your word today. What an awesome sight that must have been for John. And we're just so thankful that he gave us his best description of you in his words. And I pray this morning you would help us. Help us this morning. Help me to share your word. Let it be strong and powerful. And I pray if there's someone that is here today who doesn't know you, help them to give their heart and their life to you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. And amen. Now before you sit down, turn to the person next to you and say, you look about as good on this Sunday as I think you're going to look. <laughs> trying to explain that, but don't, <laughs> just don't give it a try. I like that Disney thing, let it go. <laughs> what a beautiful picture this is. John is in the book of Revelation talking about how things were going to be at the end of time. There is, you know, if you turn on the news any day that you watch it, seems like it's it's the bad report. There's really no good news that comes out of it. And virtually any continent you were to travel on today, you would find war that's going on in the world. Wars, and they're going to increase. Things are not going to get better in the world. It doesn't matter who we elect. It doesn't matter what happens. We'll do our part. We'll do. We'll prayerfully do our part. Vote for the candidate that, that we believe that, uh, gives honor to God and to His kingdom and can do the, the best job, but even their best laid plan, we know what the back of the book says. We know what is going to happen, we as believers. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming back to this earth. And the good news is for us who are here this morning, the church of Jesus Christ, He said, I, I don't want you to be ignorant con concerning the end when I'm coming. Now, no man knows the day or the hour when He's coming. But, but he said, of the times and seasons, I want you to understand when I'm coming. I want you to know what is going on so that the day of the Lord, when He comes, that that day will not overtake you like a thief in the night. Amen. I was a little boy. Our house was broken into. And I remember the feeling that I had. It was, it was not a good feeling. We didn't know it was coming. Or he, it might have been a, a she, but we, we figure it. And, and, okay, you want equal rights. Yeah, Somebody right. broke in the house. <laughs> Somebody come in and got our stuff. If we had known the thief was coming, we would have been waiting on him. We would have called the cops and said, hey, come on out, it's going to happen. And, and, and to that, of course we didn't know, and to that, 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 that's what he's saying. He said, I don't want you to be caught unaware. I want you to know what is going on. And when we hear the news and we see everything's going on in the world, we know that Jesus is coming. But war is not something that's just happened. 
What we see that is going on is manifest in the flesh. It's something greater that is going on in the spiritual world. What's happening in the spiritual world reflects into the physical world in which you and I are living. You go back to the beginning of Scripture. Isaiah and Ezekiel tell us about a battle. Tell us about a war that has been raging for thousands of years. There was an angel by the name of Lucifer. And he had a very coveted relationship with God. The Bible says he was beautiful. He was the son of the morning. And, and he made great music. And he was pleasant and beautiful to look at. But something happened to this angel that God had created. And when God creates something, we cannot imagine what Lucifer must have looked like. To see an angel walk into a place. It was a, a created being that, that God had created. So no doubt there was brilliance with him. And, but the Bible says that he lifted himself up as God. He saw God's throne. And he wanted to be like God. The Bible says he wanted to have his own throne. But he wanted to exalt his throne even above God. Above the throne of God. The stars of God. And the Bible said pride came into his heart. And came into his life. The Bible says Ezekiel and Isaiah tell us that he was cast out of heaven. And a third of the angels went with him at that point in time because of the rebellion that was in their heart, the pride that was in their life. Now, what, can you imagine how he must have felt? Imagine how Lucifer must have felt. He had a very coveted relationship with God. But now he finds himself cast out of that relationship, cast out of the beauty of heaven in the darkness. Can you imagine how he felt? No doubt he wanted to get back in God. No doubt he hated God. But what could he do to God? What could Satan, Lucifer, same, same, same <coughs> spiritual being, Lucifer was his name, Satan we call him today, what could he do to God? Because there's only one God. It doesn't matter how, how many people in the earth today try to tell us there are other gods. There is only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah is His name. And, and, but no doubt He wanted to do something to Him. But let me share with you this. If there was anything that Satan, Lucifer, could have done to God, I believe He would have done it right then. If he, could have, if he could have exalted the throne, that's what he wanted. He wanted to exalt his throne above him. If he could have done that, he would have done it right then. But there was nothing that Satan could do to God until God created man. And the Bible says that in the book of Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Bible says that God said, out of the chaos that was there, the Bible says the earth was without form and void. In other words, it was chaotic. Now, I can't fully understand that. Why a perfect God of order created something and it was chaotic. But I, I received that. But look what happened after that. The Bible says God said, let there be light and there was light. God said, let there be a firmament. Let there be the earth. Let there be dry land. All through the book, out of the chaos that was there, the God that we serve created and divine order came out of the chaos Understand that everything we see and everything we cannot see today in the universe is there because God spoke it into existence. And the sun is where it is today because God created it and told it not to move. Do you understand this morning that if the sun were to move one degree away from us, that we would freeze to death? If the earth moved one degree or a half a degree towards us, that we would burn up? But God said, Son, stand where you are. And the sun and the universe today is held together by the power of God's Word. That is the awesome God that we serve today. And I'm glad that I come into this place today and there is chaos in the world. It's easy to get depressed when you hear it. There's struggles in the world and every one of us that walk through the door today, we have struggles of one kind or another. But I know this morning who is on the throne. He is my God. Nothing is changing around Him. And regardless of what is going on in the world today, He's not nervous about it. 
He didn't have to get up and take a Prozac to deal with it. He is comfortably on the throne and he's God today and it is in him to us who know him that we live, we move, we have our feet and nothing can touch us when we're in the hands of an almighty God. Will you give him praise for that? The Bible says God created man. His most precious treasure, most precious creation was us. And the Bible said that He wanted to have fellowship with us. And so He scooped out of the dust of the ground. He made Adam. And the Bible says that, that you know, it was just a skeleton. It was just a structure. And the Bible says that God breathed into Him the breath of life. It was more than a physical breath. It was more than just physical breath. It was a spiritual breath of communion and fellowship. When you know the Lord Jesus Christ, there is communion with the Lord. There is peace that passes all understanding. And of course, he saw that it wasn't good for him to be alone. And he, he caused him to go to sleep. And when he wakes up, there was the most gorgeous thing he'd ever seen in his life. All right, it's just, it's just it's getting a little tight in here right now. <laughs> he created a helpmate. He created a woman. Yes. Amen. He woke up and he was married. Man. <laughs> no shower. No, no shower, no wedding, no nothing, no, no expense. <laughs> Amen. All right. Amen. And the Bible says, and it was good. It is a good thing. But immediately Satan sees it and God would commune with them and fellowship with them. In the cool of the day, he would come and walk with them and talk with them in the garden. And the only one thing he told them not to do, the tree of, of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. That's the only thing that they had to do. But then alone, Satan sees a way that he can steal the fellowship away from God. Let me tell you something. The battle that you and I are in today, it is not about us. It is about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Satan still wants to get back at God. He hates God. And the way that he can do that is to break the fellowship and the relationship between man and God. And so you know the story that with temptation, that Satan broke the fellowship they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They began to talk about it. Eve did it. She, she gave to her husband. They tried to blame each other. And the moment that they disobeyed God, they began to feel things they had never felt before. The first thing that they felt, they felt the presence of God lift off of their life. Listen, when you transgress against God's Word, the greatest thing that happens is you no longer, or the worst thing that happens is you no longer feel the presence of God. There is no peace in your heart. There is no peace in your life. There is turmoil. That is a result of sin. That is what Satan wanted. The fellowship being broken. The Bible says they started to die. Though so that immediately things begin to happen in their life and in their bodies. When they sinned, Botox came in the world. <laughs> they started wrinkling. They, the, the aging process started. That, that's where it all started, okay? Let's, just, let's get real here this morning. That's where, and every one of us that's in this place today still live under the penalty of what happened in the garden. The, the aging process began in their bodies. Bodies began to deteriorate. But the greatest thing was the spiritual separation that they felt from God. But God was not caught off guard. He said, I'm going to take care of you, Satan. There's going to be one that's going to come and it's going to crush your head. He's going to take away your authority. In the very beginning of God's Word, He knew what exactly in His omniscience He knew what was going to happen. But He said, I'm going to provide a way that man's fellowship can be restored with me. That's the reason the Bible said John proclaimed it when he saw it as the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The Jesus that I am talking to you about today loved us before the world was ever created. He loved us before He ever knew us. And in the beginning of time, He was willing to come and to give His life that we might have fellowship and abundant life with Him. 
And so throughout the ages, the fellowship, the, 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 the Lamb was slain. The day of atonement, the priest would walk into the Holy of Holies. But the Bible said that when the fullness of time had come, the perfect time that God sent His Son, it was the perfect time. Everything was just right. World conditions were right for Jesus to come. And the Bible said that He came. And early up, Satan had heard the prophecies. He heard the prophecies of Isaiah that one was going to come. The, the chastisement of our peace was going to be upon him. And with his stripes we would be healed. He knew something was going to come. So that night when the angels sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, don't you know that Satan began to tremble? Because he knew that something strong had come on the face of the earth. And so what did he do? He purposed in the very beginning that he was just going to kill it before he ever got started. And if you read the gospel account, the Bible says that, that Satan stirred up Herod to kill all the babies in the region two years of age and under. Do you remember that story? The reason he was stirred up was Satan stirred him up. He knew that something special was about this boy. So he decided he was going to kill him in the very beginning. But God warned Joseph in a dream that something was coming. And the Bible says that they fled down to Egypt and they avoided the mass destruction of killing of all the babies. And life goes on. And this Jesus raises up. He comes as a little teenager and finds himself in the temple. Amazing people with the words that he would speak. He was in the temple. Mary and Joseph had gone off in a journey. And they come back. He's a teenager now. And we always, I always have to go back to the teenage stories. And so he's a teenager. And can you imagine? I can't even imagine how he got lost from his dad and mom to start with. Yeah. It had to be a big migration of people that was moving that direction. But Jesus stays back. And then when they realize it was two days back to get to where he was, they come back in to where Jesus was and they begin to dialogue with him. Now I love this dialogue that they have. Because, you know, you read the story and you just read things and they come busting in the door and find Jesus where He is after He's been gone for two days now. Get the picture. You've lost your kid for two days. And you read the Scripture and they come back in and they go, Where have you been? I just have to put a little more with it than that. Because I think I know how I would have come through the story. <laughs> Where in the world? <laughs> We've been looking for you for two days. I think I, I probably went off on my kids. <laughs> but I love that word though. They said, why have you been looking for me? Just what, see, why have you been looking for me? Have you ever teenagers ever asked yeah. you and you told them just, why? If your teenagers ever do that, your grandkids ever ask you why, you can say they're being just like Jesus because that's the first thing he said. Why? So take that home with me, Dave, for whatever it's worth. It wasn't worth anything in my life. But Jesus grows up. And he begins to do miracle signs. He begins to teach and he begins to preach. And miracles begin to happen that this Jesus did sign. He healed sick people. People that were dead came back to life. And Satan is with Jesus the whole time. He watches everything he does. He listens to every word he says. And then he says, okay, he's a man. He was born. Uh, uh, he was born like a man. He's a man, and he will yield to temptation exactly like Adam and Eve did. And the Bible says that he came to him. He came to him three times, representing every avenue that you and I could be tempted. And every time Jesus would respond with what? He would respond with the word of the Lord. He he would say, "It is written." It's it's in the book. He would say. Every time he would say it's written, I'm telling you this morning, there is authority and power in God's Word. Satan knows the Word of the Lord. And he's not going to come to you when you're right in the middle of revival, when everything is going good and you're feeling terrific. No, he's going to do you like he did Jesus. 
when he was in the wilderness, when he was alone, when he was fasting, at a time of aloneness, the enemy's going to come and begin to whisper to you. But the greatest way, the greatest source of our authority and power in those moments is the Word of Almighty God. It is quick, it's alive, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And John saw it, and he said, I saw a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth that represents the Word of the Lord. And when the enemy comes, to you. You take this book to him and you begin to slash and you begin to quote the word of the Lord to the enemy and the enemy will leave you alone. And the Bible says Jesus came out of the wilderness with power and with authority. Amen. So the enemy stayed with him. And it come to a point where he said I have got to kill him. I have got to take his life from him. And you know the story. Palm Sunday they come in and everybody's rejoicing. Hosanna, Hosanna. Glory to God in the highest. But the very group that had, that had loved Him one week were killing Him the next. And the Bible says that they took Jesus and they whipped Him and they beat Him and they placed Him on a cross. They put a crown of thorns upon His head. You say you're a king? We'll put thorns upon your head. And above it was written, King of the Jews. And the Bible says there Jesus hung from, from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The most cruel death that could possibly be lived. It was a horrible thing. It was a disgrace to be crucified on a cross in that day. Two thieves to be hung between two common thieves. The Son of God, He who knew no sin, none, became sin for us. Do you understand this morning when He was on the cross that He was taking our sin to the cross? He was taking my sin to the cross. He was taking your sin to the cross. Every sin that we would ever commit, Jesus would take it to a cross. But not only us, He would take the sin of the entire world upon the cross. Every man, woman, boy and girl and never one time would he buckle underneath the weight of the load of that it was a it, he was fully god he was fully man he who knew no sin became sin for us that we could be redeemed to god and the bible says that that afternoon that he gave up the ghost he died the bible says they come over a soldier come to see if he was dead the other two soldiers were there. They were still gasping for breath. And so the common practice was to speed up death. It was getting dark. They would break their legs. That way the asphyxiation, they couldn't push themselves up to, to get their breath. The, the lungs would fill up with water and literally they would drown on the cross. It's how they would die. The Bible says... They come to Jesus and it already been prophesied in Psalms that not one bone of His body would be broken. The Bible says that Jesus had already given up the ghost and they never broke one bone of the Lord Jesus Christ because He had already given up the ghost and died. But let me tell you, when He did, the Bible says there was a veil in the temple that only the high priest could go behind once a year for the atoning sins of the people. To make, to, to, to make atonement, it was blood that had to be shed. God let Adam and Eve know in the very beginning that the only thing that would bring them into alignment, positional restoration and fellowship with God was the shedding of blood. The high priest would walk into that. Behind that veil, they would tie a rope around his leg because it was such a sacred thing. If there was one spot of sin in the high priest's life, God would strike him down. So serious it was. And they wouldn't dare enter in behind that. If he were to die, they would pull him out with a rope. They wouldn't dare enter into that sacred place. But the Bible says the moment that he gave up the ghost, the sun hit its face, the earth began to tremble, and the veil of the temple came down on its own. The power of God brought it down. What does that mean, men and women? It means that you and I can walk into the presence of God. We can say, Lord, forgive us of our sin. We don't have to talk to a man. We don't have to talk to anybody to make atonement for our sin. We can talk to God ourselves and ask Him to forgive us of 
our sin and immediately the presence of God can come into our heart and come into our life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There's a verse of scripture that I love. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm almost finished. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this. In verse 7 and 8, it says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I love that because here's what that means. You know, I used to wonder, I used to think, okay, if Satan heard all the prophecies about Jesus, why'd you do that? Why'd you kill him? What this is saying is this. Satan does not have spiritual revelation of what is going to come. What it's saying, because what Paul is saying is if Satan had realized when he whipped Jesus on the back, when they beat him and, and ripped the flesh out of his back, that you and I were being healed. Yeah. But he would have never done it. Right. He never would have done it. That's right. The Bible tells us that by his stripes we are healed. Not only physically in our bodies, but spiritually in our souls. The blood of Jesus heals us. Amen. Amen. If he had known when he placed the crown of thorns upon his head, when he put him on a cross, that he was taking our sin to the cross, he never would have done it. And here's the beautiful thing. Had he known that when he take, took him off the cross and they put him in a grave, hmm. that three days later, as John would say, how was he that was dead, that three days later he would come out of the tomb with the keys, of death, hell, and the grave. The greatest opposite. He would have the keys. He would, he, he would have the authorities, what it's saying, over anything we would ever face. Jesus would have the authority over it. He never would have done it. He said, I was he that was dead, but now I'm alive and I live forevermore. And the moment, men and women, that you come to Jesus Christ, you live forevermore. Eternal life is not something that begins when you die physically in this world. No, eternal life begins the moment you receive Jesus into your heart and into your life. Because eternal life means peace with God. You can be in a chaotic world, but you can have peace that passes all understanding. You can have joy in your life. And there is not one idol God. There is not salvation in Amen. Buddha. There is not Amen. salvation in Allah. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive this morning. Have a wonderful life. Bow your heads. My Father, we love you this morning. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house. Thank you for this day. This family and friends day. You knew in the very beginning who would be here today. You knew exactly what they would be wearing. You would know their thoughts. You would know their difficulties. And you saw them, Lord, in eternity before you ever created anything. You were willing to come that they might have life. Every one of us in this place that we would have life. Not just life, but we would have abundant life. I pray this morning as this simple gospel message has gone forth. I pray that your Holy Spirit has, has touched their heart that they don't know you and made them aware of their condition. But Lord, we know your coming is soon. And you have created a place that you did not mean for us to go. There is a hell. There's also a heaven. You created hell for the devil and his angels. You never meant for us to go there. But we, but we know, Lord, from your word that if we do not know you, that is the place of eternal punishment. But touch your people this morning. We don't want to go there. And I pray nobody that's hearing my voice this morning 
goes to that place. Touch them this morning, I pray. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, nobody's looking. If you would just say with me this morning, I don't really know this Jesus that you're talking about. I don't have a relationship with Him. Oh, I've heard about Him. But let me tell you, hearing about Him is not enough. The Bible says this, that if we confess our sin, that He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. It doesn't matter what you've done. The Lord will cleanse you and forgive you of every sin. You would say with me this morning, I really do not know this Jesus. I don't have a personal relationship with Him. And if He were to come today, I'm not sure that I would be ready to meet Him. If I left this church today and, and, and there was something unexpectedly happened, and I were to go out today, and I'm not sure I would meet Him. Would you just raise your hand this morning the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Thank you. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning. Just slip it up and put it back down. That's all I'm asking you to do this morning. You're not sure that you're ready. I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want you to slip your hand up. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You can put it back down. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning. Hands are going up here this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We bless you this morning. We bless you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. While your heads are still bowed, let me just quote that scripture with you one more time. He said, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All you have to do is believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. Confess it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that God raised Him from the dead, and you'll be saved. That's what the Scripture says this morning. You can receive Him by faith. I was not there. I didn't see it, but I know, I believe I know that, that He was crucified and that He rose again. I know that. And I receive Him into my life and experience the eternal life that He has in my heart and in my life. I'm going to ask everybody to stand right now, won't you? Everybody stand. And I'm not going to embarrass you this morning, but I want you to know this morning, hands have gone up. The people that was unsure, yes, come on. <clears throat> unsure of their relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what I'm, I, I just want to do this this morning. I'm going to ask everybody to, to come out and stand right here in front of me. Would you, everybody come. Everybody come. This died for your sins. If any man is, is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. The old man dies. New life in Christ comes. And, and, and Paul also said this, he said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Because here's what the enemy will want you to do. He wants you to live in your past. He'll bring your past up to you and tell you you're not worthy of the blood of Jesus. You're not worthy of eternal life. Listen, the devil's a liar. He's the father of lies. He will never tell you the truth. He's a liar. So when he comes, take it as a compliment. Really? If he's telling you that you're not worthy, that should tell you right there, oh yes you are. Tell you you can't be forgiven. You should know right then. Oh yes, you can. And even if he doesn't, you can because this book. Whosoever will, whosoever. That's you. That's me. Give your life to him. Everybody, bow your heads, and I want you to say this prayer after me. If you raised your hand this morning, I want you to say it with all of your heart. Meaning with your heart. Meaning with your heart. 
everybody now. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Thank you this morning. Thank you this morning. For loving me. I was a sinner. You're my Savior. Thank you for dying for my sin on the cross. I confess my sin to you right now. To you only have I sinned against. Forgive me. Wash me clean by your blood. I receive you as Lord of my life. Change me from the inside out. By faith I receive you. I will live for you. Every day of my life. Help me overcome my struggles. Speak to me through your word. Make your presence real in my life. And I will serve you from this time forward. I love you, Jesus. My past is behind me. The cross is in front of me. Amen. Amen. Now, would you just give Jesus praise?